All right, welcome everyone to today's local government education program provided by the University of Illinois Extension. My name is Mike Delaney, and I'm an Extension Community and Economic Development Educator based in Ogle County here in the Northern State Line region. Welcome again. I will begin with some quick housekeeping. Uh, as always, you're welcome to write any questions you might have into the Zoom chat space by clicking on the chat icon in the lower center of the Zoom screen. We'll review the questions in a question and answer period following the presentation. Please remember also that at the conclusion of today's presentation, you'll get uh, an email with slides and a link to the recording of the webinar. If you didn't register for the webinar and are, have somebody share the link with you, uh, but would like to receive these materials afterwards, just drop your email into the chat box to let us know you'd like to receive the, uh, the materials and we'll make sure you get them. Today's webinar represents a review of the key elements of site selection practice in Illinois. To offer you the most current information on the subject, we're delighted to welcome back Cheryl Welch from Ameren, Illinois. Cheryl serves as a member of Ameren's Economic Development Leadership and manages the attraction team, which is charged with supporting community, regional, and state partners to seek out and respond to new business opportunities throughout the 43,000 square mile service territory in central and southern Illinois. Cheryl has more than 30 years of experience in utility economic development and has been with the Ameren Economic Development Department since 1998. A resident of rural Montgomery County, Cheryl's a graduate of both Lincoln Land Community College and Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. She's also a past chairman of the Illinois Development Council. So with that in mind, Cheryl, the podium, so to speak, is yours. Oh, Cheryl, you're muted. Yes, I was. Thank you. I thought I clicked on it. Um, thank you, Mike. I appreciate the, the introduction and the opportunity to participate in the Extension's local government education program once again. Um, I'd also like to welcome the participants and thank all of them for their service and dedication to their communities and residents. And I hope our time together this afternoon will allow me to share some insights I've gained um, from my hands-on economic development experience throughout the state um, over several decades um, that will be beneficial to you and your local development efforts. In 2016, I did present on how to connect your site to the prospect prospective business. And while the site selection process really has not changed much, um, there have been some differences we've seen in industry growth and site selection criteria, which I will note as we go uh, through our discussion today. So I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint and share. Let me get into presentation mode. Let me get presentation mode started. I apologize. Uh, just a moment. My screen is blocking my presentation mode and I'm trying to turn that on. There we go. Now, can you see my presentation mode? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, very good. Very good. Thank you. Um, so quickly, I just want to present some facts on Ameren. I know that I saw uh, through the participant list and several comments made that there are, are many of my colleagues that I recognize from throughout our service territory in different parts of Illinois. Chris Mannheim and I go back a long way. Um, I saw someone from Monroe County that I work very closely with, as well as some of our DCO colleagues and partners on as well as some uh, community representatives from Marion and Hillsboro. So um, I know there are some that are familiar with Ameren, but some of you are not. Um, we are actually, um, were incorporated in 1995 as a result of a pending merger of Central Illinois Public Service Company and Union Electric, forming Ameren Corporation. 
we later in early 2000s um, acquired Central Illinois Light Company based in Peoria and Illinois Power based in Decatur. Um, and they joined our Ameren Illinois operating subsidiary. Ameren Corporation is also parent to our sister subsidiary in Missouri, Ameren Missouri, which is an operating utility. We also have Ameren Services and Ameren Transmission that are part of our corporate structure. So just a quick uh, overview of who we are and what we do. Um, we employ about 8,500 men and women throughout our two state service territory, which encompasses about 64,000 square miles. We are a delivery company, an energy company delivering electricity to 2.4 million electric customers and over 900,000 natural gas customers. Uh, what is unique about our two state service territory and our Midwest footprint is that we do operate Ameren, Illinois as a de fully deregulated energy provider and Ameren, Missouri is still a regulated energy company. Our development team of 18 professionals, um, our partners in sales and marketing, and we do represent um, a significant infrastructure impact being the energy provider throughout our service territory. We also understand that economic development is relationship um, profession, and we are experienced and also understand that success is a team sport. It doesn't rely on just one entity or another. We work very closely with our community partners, regional partners, state partners, and other partners throughout um, the industry. So we'll get to the meat of, of this presentation. I, I wanna talk about attraction, the location decision process. And I think that it's important to understand there have been some changes to the aspects of business attraction um, since 2016, but basically the location decision process does not change, does not change. Those drivers primarily are focused on business success and include increasing a business's competitive position and or increasing their market share by either entry into new markets or expansion of their current market share. Um, it is important to understand that the business case analysis drives the location decision. It, it basically provides a best value analysis that considers not only cost, but quantifiable and non-quantifiable factors supporting investment decisions. Um, it's important to remember that for many of the new business attraction decisions. These are large investments. Sometimes for some companies there and, and executives that are making these decisions, this is the only attraction project they may work. Um, so it's very significant and they wanna make sure that um, they are delivering on factors such as performance, productivity, reliability, maintainability and supportability enhancements as they're making these decisions. Um, your decision makers can vary. It can be executive management. It can be the corporate um, level executives, and it can be a combination of um, different levels of management. Oftentimes the facility manager who is going to be running that facility may also be involved in that decision process, along with third party consultants such as site selection consultants, real estate brokers or corporate real estate executives. Um, one thing I'd like to note too is, is um, the information. Courtney Dunbar is a site selection and economic development leader with Burns and McDonald. And she stated in a 2019 article that uh, over the past 20 years, the number of site selection criteria used by industrial companies has grown from approximately 20 questions to as many as 70 different citing criteria. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, sometimes they ask you the same question various different ways. 
um, and it's repeated and they're looking to ensure that they fully understand those criteria. Um, a lot of the reason for the increase in the, the site selection criteria is the fact that our industry today is much more complex and sophisticated than it was 20 years ago. Uh, for example, logistics, data center industry, and advanced manufacturing all have um, a much higher level of complexity and sophistication. Um, it's important to note that as businesses or their agents are considering potential locations, they are often using different information resources. Oftentimes, um, they may be evaluating geographic regions um, and, and the locality or the state economic development professional may not even know that they're being looked at while they're doing this research online. And they're narrowing and making some geographic eliminations before you even get an opportunity to present your information directly or respond to an RFI. Um, sometimes this happens two years before a decision is made or even a year or more before an RFI is issued. So it's really critical for uh, local community partners and economic development professionals to understand um, what resources are available online that provide information on your locality or region. For example, um, many of us are familiar with the Intersect Illinois Zoom Prospector site um, and application that we utilize to submit buildings and sites and respond to RFIs. But are you aware that not only do they have your building and site information, that tool also includes demographic data, labor data, occupation data, et cetera. So you at least want to go in and review that information on your community or your locality or your properties and make sure that you're aware of that and what is represented out there. It may be a different source of information than what you have access to. And you wanna make sure that it is information that is truly reflective of your region or locality so that you don't get eliminated uh, just due to difference in um, information and data. So jumping right into the site selection factors, really what, what are those important site selection factors? And, and we typically turn to a couple of different sources. One of them is Site Selection Magazine. Um, they do an annual survey of corporate real estate executives. And I refresh this to look at their 2020 survey, which is their most recent and uh, provide the top 10 list. And you can see um, that this really focuses on workforce, transportation, regulatory uh, requirements and permitting processes, taxes, right to work issues. Um, interestingly enough, utility cost and reliability back in 2016 went, ranked number four and has now moved down to number seven. You'll also see quality of life, incentives, and legal um, climate. What I thought was interesting back in 2016, we actually had land and building prices and supply listed in the top 10 on this survey. Um, that is no longer the case. It didn't even make the top 10. I, I think that it, it's considered a given in today's industry, you basically can't sell from an empty wagon. So if you don't have available development ready sites, your area will be eliminated, even if you are in the geographic search parameters for new business attraction opportunities. Another source that we often look at is Area Development Magazine. They also do a um, they do a corporate survey as well as a consultant survey and their 36th annual survey, corporate survey, uh, which was released first quarter of this year actually listed um, these top 10 um, site criteria for projects for uh, business attraction. So what's significant here is that we're seeing proximity to major markets 
as well as proximity to suppliers appear on this top 10 list. And um, that was not the case in 2016, but I think with the supply constraints we've all been facing across the US due to the COVID pandemic, these are not surprising. It, it's even more important for uh, companies to be near their major markets, but also to their suppliers. Um, that is often a, a, a citing criteria that is critical to their decision-making process. So most, uh, both the Site Selection Magazine and the Area Development Survey ranking are pretty consistent. They, they vary a little, but it's important for a local community to um, be prepared to respond to all of both of these uh, list of criteria, as well as other information that you typically would see in an RFI. So moving on, um, I think that we need to recognize that um, the site selection process is not a process of selection. They're not looking for the best site. What they're looking for is the final site. So it's, it's a process of elimination. So when you're thinking about your attraction um, program, you need to really think of it from that perspective of what could eliminate my, my property or my community or region from the site selection process. So um, those are the items you want to address. So I, I wanted to provide you with these three um, items and we'll, do, we'll uh, dive into them a little more deeply, but um, I think that first and foremost, focusing on your business retention and expansion first and then attraction is the top thing that a local uh, community or region can do to, uh, to avoid elimination in the business attraction process. It's much easier to retain and grow your existing businesses and industries than it is to attract new business. In addition to that, business prospects often look at existing business operations and geographies that they're considering and their growth in those geographic regions as well as if they're interested in your region, they may speak to some of your existing businesses and industries uh, regarding local business climate, workforce, and other factors that may be important to their decision process. Site preparedness. Um, I, I've been doing this for a th more than three decades, and I can tell you that um, a cornfield designated as, as an industrial site will be eliminated today. Um, prospective businesses and industries are looking for site readiness. And you need to utilize your partners. And I've listed out several of the partners um, that you need to, to connect with and utilize but you may look for programs that they have, their expertise and direction to assist as you develop your business attraction program. If you're new to business attraction, you're really not sure what an RFI looks like. Uh, your partners can share past RFIs on projects that are no longer active and can give you guidance and assistance. Many of them um, understand what it takes to evaluate a site fully and what kind of criteria you may wanna look, look at and be able to document on your properties as well as your community. So I really think we need to look at these three a little more closely and that's where we're gonna focus the rest of our discussion. So I did want to give you um, this example. Last month, Governor Pritzker um, and Ferraro announced the first ever U.S. Kinder Bueno production facility in Bloomington. It's a 214.4 million dollar investment, and it create will create 200 new jobs. What's interesting, this new facility is actually a new expansion of Ferraro's Bloomington facility. Um, the company first began to uh, focus their investments in Illinois, beginning with its acquisition of the Bloomington Nestle facility in 2018, followed by a 2021 groundbreaking of its processing expansion with a new chocolate production factory. And that is expected to be completed in 2023. And now this 2022 announcement of the new Kinder Bueno 
production facility, which is slated for completion in 2024. Um, in the press release, um, the governor did quote the fact that the annual economic impact by this company in Illinois is nearly $300 million with over 1,350 current full-time staff within the state and more than 350 of those are located in Bloomington, and making Ferraro one of the largest employers in the area. It's important to remember as you're embarking on business attraction in the site selection process, that 80% of a locality or region's growth is going to come from your existing business and industry base, while attraction only accounts for 20%. So definitely when I speak to community partners um, throughout our service territory, I am always encouraging them to have a robust business retention and expansion program developed before they move into their attraction efforts. The bottom line here is that br &E programs matter and they are critical to a locality or region's economic vitality. And the importance of this program should never be overlooked in your site selection initiatives at the local level. So let's look at site preparedness. Um, whether you have a mega site or not, the evolved modern approach is a master planned campus style phased in development. And when we talk in terms of mega sites, um, rule of thumb typically is that a mega site is a thousand acres plus. And this approach should not just be used for mega sites. It should be used even for smaller projects. Uh, master plan sites should also offer flexibility uh, to allow for mod modifications. For example, you may have a um, site that you have planned for multiple buildings, but it may also work for a single large facility. Master plan site should provide details about easements, wetlands, drainage, and other features considered in the site selection process. And embarking on the process as outlined can greatly help locations compete for projects. Unfortunately, many places skip right to items three and four. Um, site certification, which I've crossed off and, and I indicated as site readiness, as well as marketing. But um, as speed to market factors continue to increase in importance, and we've seen that ever uh, increasing since COVID, um, this can be a serious mistake. So the, the issues um, with site certification is it's not industry specific. Certified sites can distinguish sites on the basis of availability of services, documented site development capabilities and assurances of permitting and build times. However, not every certified site is going to work for every user. And sites that may not qualify for certification may also be viable sites for specific industries. So it's important um, to do your diligence and your planning, know your targets, um, and approach those targets accordingly. The shotgun approach, and, and I'm, I'm borrowing that term from a dear friend and, and um, a colleague, someone that I view as a mentor, Eric Canada. Many of us have, have trained or, or participated in courses that Eric has provided, but the shotgun approach, um, where you shoot at everything and you claim everything that falls, no longer applies in today's competitive business attraction process. Um, we see this with a lot of statewide RFI responses. Um, we see that regions and areas up, uh, will submit for an RFI, whether they have really um, they, they really have documented whether they can support that type of business or industry in their community. And um, your, your opportunity for success will be greatly reduced in doing that shotgun approach and not being targeted and specific and following this process all four steps through. So, um, 
I did want to talk a little bit about an actual project that I think I skipped a little too far. Nope. I wanted to talk about one of the projects recently um, that I worked. It was uh, called the Project Green Dream. This was a um, project from 2021. Um, the RFI was released in early 2021 and an announcement on a metro region was made in August of 2021. Um, this lead came from a regional development group, the St. Louis Regional um, Development Group, that is the Alliance STL, and was specific to the St. Louis region. Initially, the St. Louis MSA uh, was being considered along with other metro areas for a new vertical farm operation to grow leafy greens. So on this project particularly, we um, had the vertical farm operation. They were searching for a site to construct a new building in the St. Louis by state metro area. The client had a preference to green site options and uh, wanted uh, an opportunity for a build to suit facility. It could be a developer controlled um, build to suit site and they would only consider spec buildings if it met all their requirements, which were pretty unique given the type of industry it was. The project was codenamed uh, Project Green Dream, and that RFI deadline was six days after the release date. So um, again, I do want to stress too, you know, we're seeing quicker and quicker turnaround times, not just in a prospect's need for speed to market, um, oftentimes we're seeing that the RFI data has to be turned around quickly. Now, a lot of times, you know, I, I've even thought this myself, why would they request this data so quickly when there's so much data here? But please remember, they have already done a lot of their own research online or through other resources. So they're actually looking at RFI responses as it relates to data that they have already collected on specific geographic regions. On this project, the overview included a description of the project. We knew there was a capital investment of $61 million. Again, this goes back to what I previously said. These are very large investments. They want to make sure they're making good business decisions. Um, this had a full, full employment projected to be 100 employees, but it did not provide a timeline um, or a project schedule. So some of the requirements that were listed, um, the, this was a, a kind of a um, indicator up front when they listed as, as their first critical location factor, the cost at each location. So some projects are very cost adversive. So they're looking very closely. Um, they want to maximize their, not only their upfront costs to locate, but also their operating costs moving forward. Um, they also wanted to understand incentives, which can help offset that upfront cost and how that would apply to each location. They did list their uh, real estate requirements um, based on the acreage of the site that they were looking at, the square footage of the building, their ceiling height. Um, they also provided the utility requirements in terms of electric, water, sewer, and natural gas. The filter on this was initially, um, we had six sites in the Metro East area or on the Illinois side of the bi-state region that were submitted. Two Madison County sites were visited and scored along with several sites on the Missouri side based on the site size and configuration, the build to suit options that would be available for the company, the electric service, the incentives, and the overall cost evaluation. The Illinois sites were actually eliminated um, and the final location has yet to be determined, but it, they have announced that the next facility will be in the St. Louis Metro area. Um, and that the reason for 
Illinois sites being eliminated were primarily due to the differences in overall unit economics between the two states. Uh, specifically, lower electric rates were quoted, and this really had to do with the supply side and the uncertainty in a deregulated market. And um, this particular company was not familiar with deregulated energy markets and securing third party supply contracts. So they weren't, they, they felt this was a risk that they weren't willing to take. Additionally, they listed labor pool analysis, um, providing optimal opportunities for attraction and retention of the talent that they required in the Missouri portion of the MSA versus the Illinois portion. And that is the end of my formal comments. So I would like to ask if there are any questions that I can answer and open up the floor for uh, dialogue and clarification on any of these points. Mike, you just want us to jump in or go through the chat? Uh, well, tell you what, uh, why don't we jump in? You go ahead. And uh, we there are one or two questions floating in the chat, but uh, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, you noted the Illinois sites were eliminated and, and primarily due to the, the differences and specifically the utility rates, but more specifically that the Kepin is not familiar with the uh, third party providers and, and that made them hesitant. Mm -hmm. um, how can we overcome that hurdle? What is, what, how can it, we it, provide additional info to try to straighten that out? Okay, and who am I speaking to? Who am I addressing? Oh, uh, Courtney Yaki, sorry. Hi, Courtney. I thought I recognized your voice, that's why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney's one of our community partners I've worked with for a number of years. So good question, Courtney. And you know, that is difficult. We spend time trying to educate. I cannot tell you the information that I shared. Um, it is difficult because we, as the energy delivery company, cannot go out and, and, and provide them any type of information on potential um, third-party energy suppliers and what kind of contracts or rates they may have available to them. What we do um, is we look at the hour, the historic hourly supply service rate and give them an idea based on the last 12 months historic pricing, uh, real time pricing. Um, and of course, energy is is a commodity. And just like any commodity, it has varying prices and we only know data day ahead prices. So we reference several resources when we do that. Um, we actually refer them to the ICC's website plugin, uh, Illinois, which provides them with a cost to compare. Um, we also provide them with historic real-time pricing. Um, we look at um, the energy markets and provide them with a list of potential energy suppliers that are registered with both Ameren, Illinois, and with the Illinois Commerce Commission to do business in Illinois and provide third-party supply options. Um, they can also reference the Illinois Power Authority's website for more additional information, but it does provide them with a competitive option um, that may save them money, but at the same time, it does create some effort on their part to understand the market and how to utilize that. Now, to contrast that, of another project that I've been working with, uh, Intersect Illinois in the state of Illinois. And we are one of the two, we have a, an Illinois site. This is one of two finalists competing with an out-of-state site. Um, and that company, when we spoke to them about energy supply options, they already operate in a deregulated market and already fully understand that and have a third party supplier that they would utilize. So no concern on their part for it. It's just a difference in their experiences and knowledge. I have um, worked with some local development groups who have gone out and tried to solicit um, a cost that they could get from a third party supplier, which is difficult to do. Many third party suppliers are not willing to do that. They want to talk directly to the end user customer that they will be contracting with. So it is difficult to come up with, but we do try to give them enough resources to fully understand the market and what it means. 
Good question, thank Courtney. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Courtney. Um, one quick note, Cheryl, we've had a request early on uh, for a uh, citation to perhaps you could share the link to the article you cited early on in your presentation from 2019, talking about yeah. the uh, priorities. Uh, we Courtney's. Can mm -hmm. And, yes, I uh, can do that. Terrific. Uh, next question would be, um, let's see, here we go. What can small rural communities with little available land and resources do to be attractive? Big question. Uh, yeah, another good question. Um, and I would say that, you know, not, as I said, not all, not all certified sites can meet every project, but not all communities can either. There are um, many smaller rural communities that can really focus on small business development, downtown redevelopment, um, and attraction. I have uh, experience with several small communities that have done a wonderful job with their downtown redevelopment, bringing in small businesses, um, even some small manufacturers into their downtown areas and really reviving that. I think um, really going towards the uh, place development, places that people will want to live. Um, you know, today, another thing that we've noticed with COVID is that <clears throat> people don't necessarily have to live where they work. Um, so many people are working remotely or in some type of a hybrid uh, work environment. So they don't have to drive long distances from a rural community into work. They just go into their home office and, and plug in. So having access to high-speed internet, having that livability, that place um, that people will want to live, um, can revive, can vitalize an economic um, sustainability for a smaller rural community also. And there are some smaller projects. I think that's where target industry analysis comes into play. If you don't have big parcels of land, I, I mentioned smaller sites do work for certain industries. So understanding what you may be able to support and attract um, in your community and really targeting and learning about those industries. If you decide you're going after a specific type of an industry, understanding what their needs are and what their location factors might be is, is important in the process. The more you know about an industry specifically, the more you can help them. And it doesn't have to be a large industry. Next question, uh, Nick asks, how are infrastructure upgrades and timelines being addressed to accommodate these RFIs? That, good question, Nick. Um, we are, um, that, that is where the speed to market is really compressed and we're seeing, I, I'll give an example here. I, I have a, had a recent project that wanted 50 megawatts in 12 months then they wanted 150 megawatts in 24 months. And in 48 months, they wanted 240 megawatts. So again, those are, those are very compressed lead times. And I will be very um, transparent in my response. A 50 megawatt load, if you don't have that capacity available today, is not going to happen in 12 months. And what we're also finding, uh, my colleague recently attended an a consultants forum um, and had an opportunity to interact with uh, several uh, consultant panel discussions where um, these lead times and these requirements for RFIs, I mentioned that, you know, there's more citing criteria, but we're also seeing uh, more and more projects that are handled by site selection consultants are large projects in terms of their employers, employees, um, typically they employ more than 100 people and also their um, requirements as far as infrastructure and resources go. Um, they are large energy, water and sewer users um, in the process. But um, what we're being told is that most site selection consultants that are representing these projects with these compressed timelines understand that oftentimes it's a poker game with these RFIs. So we try to address realistically what is possible 
um, what it will take to meet those requirements for those infrastructure upgrades in a realistic time frame. Also, um, I will say that we have also seen some projects go back and and redefine their search criteria, whether it is those infrastructure needs or those timelines. But um, it's basically about responding um, upfront and and transparently to what is realistic, but handling that still with white gloves as far as uh, doing the best that we can to, to shorten those um, lead times, those long lead times. And I will tell you that a lot of it is um, due to supply chain. Many of our long lead times from an infrastructure perspective have to do with materials and being able to obtain those. And I will say that it is also something that they will face on the construction side. We have another question. Again, a, <clears throat> an interesting one with respect to uh, kind of the bordering uh, competition with bordering states for projects. Mm -hmm. How do we, uh, as those living and working in Illinois, compete with Missouri and Indiana? What do we have that's attractive over these neighboring states? I think our infrastructure and our existing um, business and industry that we have in our state are, are two of the key factors. Um, we do have great infrastructure from a transportation perspective. We have all seven class one railroads coming through our state. Uh, we have um, an interstate system that allows goods to be transported um, in all directions and access to um, I think more than 60% of major markets within a day's transportation from any location within the state. Um, we also have um, a, a variety of different types of communities within our state that we can compete against. There is also opportunities from uh, you know, deregulation is an opportunity, but also renewables provide opportunities for customers to be able to do some renewable generation on site um, and, and really have some control over their um, energy costs. But it, it really is our workforce, too. I think Illinois has a, a uh, high quality, high educated, um, available workforce. Um, as well as all those other factors that come into play. But it is difficult to compete. I, I cannot ignore the fact that business attraction and site selection is highly competitive. And we are comp competing against other businesses and industries, as well as locations. And, and not just neighboring states. I have to be honest with you, the Midwest is competing against the Southeast and others, other, other portions of the country too, that are probably our greatest competition than compared to neighboring states. Good. Well, it's good to hear that there are some legitimate uh, distinguishing factors on a positive, from a positive mm -hmm. perspective. Uh, yes. We've got a question slash comment from Chris Mannheim. Uh, Chris observes that business retention and attraction or, or business retention and expansion is so important uh, and but it's particularly easier to do on a regional basis rather than just on a community basis. Please elaborate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think what Chris is getting to, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, um, we have done some things regionally. I know several of the energy companies um, participated in uh, a statewide program previously uh, utilizing Eric Canada's synchronous tool. Um, ComEd, as well as NICOR and Ameren, Illinois, make that system available to our community partners, but it's important to be able to retain um, those businesses and industries, um, at not just at a local level, but a regional level, because um, if, if uh, a, a business is, is preparing to expand and there's not room or there's not opportunities within their local communities, keeping it regional within the region um, or the state is, is important also. But we're seeing trends that we see throughout different parts of the state and different regions. But 
it's a regional workforce that they're drawing from also and regional advantages. So it's important to think of it holistically and to be able to incorporate um, what retaining those businesses and industries and those presence mean throughout uh, the state. Did I touch on what you were referring to there, Chris? Yeah, Cheryl, that's exactly where I was going. Um, it, when you're using synchronous and the like, it's often difficult, particularly for a small community where they may not have enough properties to make it worth their time and effort. But if you do that, let's say at, at least at a county level, um, you have a lot of, particularly with smaller communities, uh, you've got that, uh, uh, the economy of scale there working with you. And some Absolutely. of the counties, I know like Grundy County, they focus on um, industrial properties, but they only contact the major employers every couple of years. So if you have all the communities working together in a county or, or a larger region, it's just a lot easier to do. Absolutely. And of course, in, in partnership with your utility, as <laughs> you are absolutely <laughs> right on that one. NICOR and yeah. ComEd are great to work with in our territory. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's important to, to remember that uh, those partners at the regional level uh, with your energy companies and also at the state level, it's important for us to retain and grow our existing businesses, too. Um, most of us have, I, I know Ameren, Illinois has a team of key account executives who are actually part of our economic development team. And they focus on business retention and expansion with our large customers. Um, not only are they um, your local employers and provide a tax base in lo your local community or region, they're our customers too. And we are still, even as a deregulated energy provider, connected to our service territory. And, and we grow or we decline based on the economic vitality of our communities. Um, and we are very connected to our communities. So we understand that importance, but we also know that as the energy company, we are not the deciding factor on retention and expansion. It has to be a holistic approach that includes all of the business climate factors that impact their ability to compete. Any thank other? You. Thank you for that. Yeah, well, we've got we've got a list. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, connecting back to that uh, local versus regional theme a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, Gina asks: Many RFIs now have 150 plus job creation uh, requirements. What recommendations do you have to overcome the workforce challenges for 150 plus jobs for rural areas? That's a bit, you know, they're, they're perhaps it's it's a topic that. Uh, might not be directly in your uh, your normal area of uh, control, but uh, perhaps we've got other folks on the call who have some experience with it as well. Yeah, I'm thinking we that I see some folks that are involved in in the workforce investment uh, groups, the workforce teams uh, throughout the state. But I do sit on a workforce investment board, and, and you know that is that is a key issue. And when I was talking about the data sources. It's important to rem remember when you're responding to these large RFIs and like Gina said, uh, 150 plus um, employees um, that they're going to be looking for, you need to understand how your workforce is being reflected out on, the, on these internet and online resources um, and, and how that pertains to these projects too. So I think being able to demonstrate that you have a labor pool a non-traditional labor pool that you can pull from is important. Um, that could mean utilizing um, folks that maybe are not in the workforce currently or could be pulled into the workforce, um, as well as looking at expanded areas. And I think one thing, you know, there are certain types of projects. I mentioned the remote work and the hybrid uh, worker uh, environments that we have today since COVID. But of course, with a factory, that doesn't work. You have to be in the factory and you have to be um, present to run the equipment and produce the products. So um, there are certain industries that have to have those um, 
workforce is available. And I think just um, creative ways. I know there have also been some ways that some communities have um, aggressively tried to attract um, new residents to their community. It may be through offering um, an incentive like um, some dollars that can go towards the cost of a down payment on a home if you stay in the community for a certain amount of time. Um, it, it could mean some dollars to start them up or assistance in helping them find a position within the community. But I think that's an issue not just faced by rural communities, it's becoming a real issue across the entire uh, country. And again, I would I would open it up if any of our workforce experts have uh, differing thoughts or want to share their perspectives. While we've got a moment here, let's we're going to take a second and put up a quick poll. Uh, love for those on the call to just take a moment and give their answer to it. Um, yeah, oh, it's system's not letting me do it at the moment. Well, we'll try to get that up. Um, in the meantime, we do have a couple more questions. Carla asks, how do we find small industry resources? We're a small rural community with land, but no site ready. Also, we've got landowners are leasing land to farmers. How do we get the land land owners on board? So I'm sorry, can you re rephrase the first part of that question again, Mike? And I, because I, I, I was thinking through that, no no site development, is that what I heard? Well, the, the first part of the question was, how do we find, you, you'd referred to, uh, you talked about uh, targeting uh, smaller industries if you're a smaller community. So the question that was phrased is, how do we find small industry, I think it was intended to mean resources or sources, small industry sources, uh, and then we are a small rural community with land, but no site ready. Also, landowners are leasing land to farmers. How do we get the landowners on board? Um, so there was a whole lot of pieces there. That's why I'm I'm yeah. I'm trying to capture some of those. So as far as industry specifics, um, a couple recommendations I would make is if you have, um, you know, your local chamber might be able to help in a smaller community, maybe not. But if you can go to a regional uh, metro area and ask them for some assistance, I was recently working with uh, one of our community partners and they had a question on an RFI related to um, particular industries. And they were able to go to their library and find some resources um, at their library, some business directories. I, I would, um, you know, if you're looking at targeting smaller industries, I think it's important to first assess what your community has to offer. Do a SWOT analysis. Um, understand your strengths, your weaknesses, what opportunities and what threats you have. And um, I think in doing that, then once you have documented that, you can also work to try to, to um, do some research on industries. You can consult with um, research groups at the state level, um, at the regional level. Your energy company partners can also assist. Um, we do have uh, oftentimes uh, access to um, research that are that we do at a corporate level but we also have knowledge based on our customers um, we cannot divulge any any customer specific information but we can tell you what we see in in terms of trends and small businesses and that type of stuff that could help you target and then there are various trade publications um, trade organizations that you could utilize to learn more about specific industries that you think you may want to target um, it's not going to be something that you're going to do quickly no, es así. no seas como a otras cosas gastas de so i'm hearing someone else talk is that just me yeah no there was some somebody else's mic was okay up. 
Okay. So, yeah, I, th I think that, you know, being able to look at um, those industry sectors, um, oftentimes, like I said, just partner with your, your, your state partners, your regional partners, your energy partners, talk to your local business base that you have in your community, find out what their thoughts are. Um, oftentimes, too, um, your existing business base can provide you some idea of target industries. Ask them if they have suppliers uh, or um, industries that they supply to that they would like to have closer uh, that would be beneficial. And that may give you a better idea of who you could target. Pertaining to um, having land but not being site ready, um, you can do that, you know, by by researching by attending some conferences. There are a lot of webinars available these days. I'll provide that information on Courtney uh, Dunbar's article and her information, but um, looking at the uh, various site selection publications, if you don't subscribe to them, um, I, I would recommend you do. They have good articles on different uh, industries as well as the site selection process and site development. But there are typically some, you know, I mean, if you do research online for site readiness or uh, site certification, you don't actually have to spend thousands of dollars to make a site certified, but really just researching and making sure that you have a site that is ready for development. I do understand your question too about the, you know, a landowner who wants to market their property for potential business location may go ahead and lease it out to farmers um, so that they have some income on that land. Um, it, it does kind of work against the, the whole site selection process when it's, when it's a farm field, unless it's ready with infrastructure, but Oftentimes, that's not going to be the case. You're not going to have a roadway in. You're not really going to have infrastructure uh, capable or within uh, a site that is being developed. So um, those will be trade-offs, but just understand what it would take to get the infrastructure there or make road improvements to that site and maybe do some research on how quickly that could be done. So one of the important things are you don't have to overcome every hindrance 100% just understand what the hindrances are to the development and the sites and make sure that you have a plan in place to address it. And then there might've been a second part that I've totally, if you could rephrase that, Mike. No, I, I think that you, you covered- Did I cover the, it all? You, okay. You covered, you covered the content that Carla had posted. Valerie okay. followed up with a related, and you may have already, I, I think you covered a lot of what she was getting at. She was asking about following up for target industry analysis for small rural communities and asks how we learn about these and locate these when sites like Synchronist aren't really for the types of sites we would have available. Okay, so and I think um, that Valerie be, might be pertaining to Synchronous and, and the business retention and expansion tool that most of the energy companies provide to their community partners is geared towards Synchronous Prime, which are the major employers and not the commercial retail tourism side of it, um, if, I'm, if I'm not if I'm understanding correctly. So um, yes, Synchronist is probably not going to give you um, the industry targets that you're looking for or really prove beneficial from a BRNE perspective. That doesn't mean you can't utilize some of those major concepts um, to assist with the BRNE program. But the target industries are going to be, you know, if, if you're um, a smaller rural community, you really, again, I would go back to the SWOT analysis, understand your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and, and then really look at what is a good fit for your community and what your community is a good fit for. Um, as I said, there are many ways to do that, but learning more about uh, industry sectors, doing some research online, um, consulting with some of your partners um, can be very helpful. I think Intersect has a research um, team also that can help provide information, existing information to if you're trying to determine, you know, what type of, of smaller industry or businesses could be viable options. And I would also recommend, which I haven't said it yet, and I apologize for overlooking it, your small business development centers are definitely a resource for rural communities looking for smaller um, 
businesses and industries to target. Terrific, I think, and uh, I think you've, in the course of those comments, you've addressed a couple of the following questions uh, that Carla had posed and that um, Valerie had posed. Um, so I think at that point, uh, this is probably we have reached our hour and we'll have, um, oh, Pam Lopez from Growth Dimensions, uh, Pam Fettis from Growth Dimensions uh, up here in Boone County re references Select USA will also help with industry targeting. Yes, and, and some of those foreign direct investment uh, opportunities can be smaller employers also. That's correct. Thank you. Well, listen, uh, I think we're, as I say, we're at our time, and uh, this is probably a good place to say thank you so much, Cheryl, for taking the time to be with us today. We're grateful that uh, you've given us the benefit of your expertise and um, contributed to the, uh, the learning of local leadership across the state. Um, as I mentioned Thanks. earlier, for the folks that are still on the call, uh, if you registered for the webinar, you're going to receive the presentation materials as a matter of course and a link to the recording in a follow-up email. Uh, if you just borrow the link from a friend or had it referred and didn't actually go through the registration process, just drop your email into the chat and we will make sure that you get those materials. Uh, also, I'd like to invite everybody here to visit our website to register for future webinars. Uh, that would be go.illinois.edu slash LGE. For example, coming up next month is the fourth installment for our IEPA Watershed Water Quality Series on uh, water quality protection assistance. And you can use that same resource uh, to find recordings of a host of prior presentations dating back well, it's a great library on a wide variety of community and economic development related topics. So on that note, thank you all once again for attending today's webinar. Have a great day and we hope you'll join us for future presentations. Thank you, Mike. Stopping the recording now.